in fellowship time. Uh, also, I want to bring your attention to Center Shot is starting up again. Uh, Mike, that's Thursdays and Saturdays? Yep. Okay. In February and in March? Well, no, mostly just through February. Mostly just February. Sessions. So eight total sessions. Okay. Uh, Center Shot? Yeah, Thursday, Thursday evenings and then Saturday mornings. Thursday evenings and Saturday mornings. So that begins this Thursday. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet out there. Yeah. Oh, yes. So it'll go into March a little ways. Okay. Well, there's a sign-up sheet out there on the, the, in the fellowship hall. Sign up if you'd like to take part in that. Uh, and uh, that'll give Mike some more uh, information on, about uh, how many to expect. Also, the Pregnancy Resource Center's Baby Bottle Fundraiser ends next week. I think there are some baby bottles still out there. So if you haven't taken one and, and filled it with coins and checks and whatever, uh, please do so. They are due back next Sunday. Also coming up in February, our Valentine's Banquet that is hosted by the youth group, that's a fundraiser for the youth group, is on February 16th at 5 p.m. There is a sign-up sheet out on their, the youth bulletin board. Uh, please sign up for that so they know how many people to expect for food. Uh, also, there's a sign-up there as well for if, you're, if you would like somebody to watch your children during that time too. The children will also be fed out in the back, uh, so no need to feed them beforehand. Also coming up, Good Shepherd is having a leadership retreat on February 23rd. If you have any uh, ideas or concerns or anything like that that you'd like us to discuss, please talk to either Craig Anderson, Mike Berg, or either myself or Pastor Mark. Uh, if you want to also attend uh, and you haven't gotten an invitation, please see one of us as well. And it's, it's open to anybody, but we would like to know how many people to expect. I believe there is a meal, right, as well. So we'll need to know that for that, especially. Um, also, I will be having a new members class February 24th after the service. So from about noon to 3 or 4. Uh, and lunch is going to be provided for that. So... If you are interested in becoming a new member, just let me know. That's all you have to do. Uh, and then we will have that on February 24th. Uh, and I think that's all you need to know about that at the moment. Uh, last thing I'm going to mention is that Campus Days at, at the Association Free Lutheran Bible School is coming up on, in March. Uh, if your child would like to go, please see Pastor Mark for any more information on that. That is all I'm going to mention. Make sure to check your bulletin for any other announcements. At this time, let's stand and sing our opening hymn number 24 in the red hymnal.
Please remain standing as we confess our sins together. The communion service is found on pages 2 through 4 in the blue hymnal. Pages 2 through 4 of the blue hymnal. Let us confess our sins together. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake. Grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become sons of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, to us all. Please remain standing as we call upon Jamie Berg to read our scripture this morning. morning. Our Old Testament reading for today is found in Jeremiah, the first chapter, beginning with the fourth verse. The call of Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The gospel reading for today is found in Luke, the fourth chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath began te- to teach the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his message had authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Ha! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What is this teaching? With authority and power he gives orders to evil spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. They asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. 
Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Christ. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Here ends the readings for today. Let us confess now our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. And you can find that on page 105 of the Blue Hymnal. Let us confess our faith together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. At this time, we'll invite our ushers up to receive our tithes and offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and what you do for us, Lord. How you've saved us, Lord. How you've redeemed us from our slavery to sin. And Lord, we want to give back to you now, Lord, the things you've made, made us stewards of. We pray, Lord, that you would bless this offering, that your name would be proclaimed. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Please stand as I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31b through 13.3. It's 1 Corinthians, the last half of the verse in chapter 12, and then all of chapter 13. And this is, I believe, the third message, third sermon in a series of six in 1 Corinthians. But let's read now in, in Jesus' name. And I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love... I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray now, Lord, that you would convict us of sin and bring us to repentance, but also speak to us your comfort of forgiveness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now that my oldest child is 12 years old, I've noticed that there are numerous levels of maturity that take place in a person. We have multiple levels within our own household even, right? I think we often think of physical growth as is what we think of when we think of maturity probably because it's most obvious to us. But there are also intellectual and emotional levels or types of maturity as well. Infanthood, or being a baby, is the beginning stage of development. Babies are completely helpless, completely dependent on others. They must be fed and changed by their parents because they don't have the knowledge or the ability to do it themselves yet. They cry because they don't have the ability to speak yet. It's interesting, though, as you look at Scripture and what Jesus says, how Scripture uses infants as the perfect example of faith. A baby trusts without questioning the object of their faith. Well, what about other stages of maturity? As infants become toddlers... They gain coordination and they begin walking. They begin feeding themselves. Toddlers become more gifted in speaking, maybe sometimes a little too gifted when they say no all the time. Toby's really good at that. Toddlers can begin dressing or maybe even undressing themselves. They start potty training. Still got to work on that one with Toby. The coming years ahead of childhood mean exponential growth. They begin to play sports and ride bikes. They start to have strong opinions of what they like and don't like. They start reading and writing and developing other skills. And by now they can talk really well. 
Right? Sometimes when there's five children in our house talking, we're like, why did we ever hope that they could speak? Because <laughs> they always are talking at the same time. But then the preteen years start, and children start to become more responsible, and they begin grasping abstract concepts. During these, these years, kids get really smart. They really do. Unfortunately, they also begin to think that their parents aren't as smart as they are. And then the full-on teenage years come. And I, I can't speak with any authority on that quite yet. Uh, but I've got to be honest, I'm a little scared to have a teen next year. I hear that they can be quite a challenge for parents. And, and some, t- some teens are rebellious. Some teens are self-centered and always looking for approval from their friends. The teenage years are, are formative years. They're years that are important in the growth of a child. Well, then teens eventually become adults. And usually adults are independent and responsible and able to make important decisions in life. Usually adults are capable of holding down a job and taking care of another human being. And I say usually because though this used to be truer in the past, I think that it's becoming less and less so. We assume that adults will be more mature as they age, But that's not always the case. Sometimes we see in our culture increasing immaturity and irresponsibility. Seems like that might be becoming the new standard. Well, the Apostle Paul parented many congregations. He established them and he he tended to view his spiritual children in terms of growth or maturity. Paul loved the people of his congregations, like Corinth. He wanted what was best for them. And like any parent, Paul didn't like seeing all the divisions and quarrels over petty things. He didn't enjoy hearing about fights over whose spiritual gifts were better. Paul absolutely hated hearing about the members of the body hurting one another and hindering its own growth. Now, for a person to grow or mature, certain things are necessary. To grow physically, children need nutritious food, restful sleep, and exercise. To grow intellectually, children need mental stimulation and constant repetition and all types of challenges. To grow emotionally, children need their parents to persevere to set rules and boundaries for them. They need their parents to be active in encouraging them and being patient with them. Most of all, though, a child needs love. Without love, their maturity won't be complete. Our God is a God of love. He heaps upon his children gifts and treasures in Christ. And what do we do? We tend to hoard those gifts. We're inclined to flaunt them or boast about them or even abuse them. For example, if the gift is the ability to speak, well, we're inclined to then speak eloquently in order to gain praise from men. Or if the gift is the capacity to understand, we're prone to try to intellectually run circles around others and argue someone into the kingdom. Or if the gift is great, miraculous faith, like what Paul talks about, we lean towards making others feel inferior spiritually. Or if the gift is fearless service or or courage and boldness, we tend to become prideful and arrogant. But what does Paul say? Without love, all these things are for nothing. They benefit no one and are nothing but loud displays of selfishness. The gifts of God and the treasures won by Christ are of no value to anyone without love as the motivation for using them. 
All they are is self-centered, self-serving, empty deeds without love. All they do is build up the person doing them. What Paul is trying to get us to see is that using the gifts of God in this manner is a major sign of immaturity. When love is absent in any thought, word, or deed, it shows that we are being selfish members of the body of Christ. Now, it's important for us to understand love according to Scripture. We tend to think of in our society that hate is the opposite of love and that love is a feeling that fluctuates depending on the circumstances. But neither of these are true according to Scripture. Sure, feelings are included in love, and hate is included in the opposite, but these are not primarily what love is about. Primarily, love is a choice that we make. Primarily, selfishness is the opposite of love. Think about it. When we put ourselves, our needs, our wants, our priorities above our neighbor's, We are indicating that we love ourselves more. And when we mostly base love on feeling and emotions, we're suggesting that love is temporary and incomplete. We are told very clearly in Scripture to love our neighbor as ourselves. So who is your neighbor? It's not just the person that you choose, the person that's easy to love. But it's also the people God puts in front of you on a daily basis. So it may be a fellow member of the body of Christ. It may be someone outside of the congregation. Or on any given day, it may just be your enemy. No matter who it is, God calls us to love them. But this is especially true regarding our fellow members in the body, though. Without love, we further the division, the self-centeredness, the immaturity of the body. Without love, the body of Christ is ineffective and unable to share the gospel with anyone. Did you hear that? The gospel is hindered when we, the body of Christ, don't embody the love of Jesus for the world. And so we must repent of our loveless ways of our petty squabbles and our silly differences. Christ calls us to repent of our impatience and irritableness towards one another. He commands us to repent of our sinful attitudes and pride and be unified in the truth of his word. There's no question about it. The body of Christ still has issues today. It always will on this side of eternity. But thankfully, Paul doesn't just show us what lovelessness and selfishness look like. He also shows us what true love looks like, too. What is love? We have to look to Scripture, to to Jesus, to find out. Only Jesus embodied love perfectly. Only Jesus gave love a face and a name. And so Jesus enters the scene and he proclaims himself the head of the body. That without him, the body has no life in it. Jesus is the demonstration of the love of the Father. He is the Redeemer who showed us what love is. See, that's why Jesus came. To paint a picture of love for us, a picture that he intends for us to copy. Take a look at verses 4 through 7 in our text for for today. Specifically, verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Now, primarily, we're going to look at just these two because these two traits of love are the most important here. Everything else that Paul mentions falls somewhere under these two. These two characteristics are predominantly attributes of God. He is patient and he is kind. Now, if you want to, you can turn to Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. This is going to help us here see the character of God. 
Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. It says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So let's, let's start with kindness first. Let's start with kindness. What is kindness? Well, according to Paul, kindness is being merciful and gracious. Okay, well then what's mercy and grace? Well, mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. Let me repeat that. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. Without mercy and grace, no one would be saved. Absolutely no one would be saved. So God's kindness means that he relented in judgment and had compassion on humanity. God's kindness also means that he persisted and continued to pursue his beloved creation. Our Father was not quick to punish in an angry way. But he chose to soften his heart toward us, and he was quick to forgive. Likewise, God calls us to forgiveness, to understanding and kindness. God tells us to remember that we have not been cast off, but that we have been forgiven an enormous debt. The body of Christ is called to embody that kind of love, the love of Christ for his brothers. The the other phrase in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, is slow to anger. This is the same idea as being patient in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 13. What does it mean to be patient? It means that your emotions are held in check, that you don't automatically assume the worst about somebody, but you put the best construction on all that somebody says or does. This doesn't mean that we never get angry, of course, but that in our anger we all too often sin. Our anger is born of selfish tendencies and selfish desires and selfish mindsets. It's actually quite rare that we are ever righteously angry at somebody. Our anger is usually tainted with sin in some way. But Paul tells us to love, to be slow to become angry. This means that love waits. It waits for an opportunity to show itself in action. See, that's what Jesus did, right? Jesus showed us love. He put flesh on an abstract concept. Sometimes that meant that Jesus would confront a person's sin. He spoke the truth about sin in our sinful hearts. And he continues to confront our sin today through his word. He doesn't ignore it by sweeping it under the rug, but he calls us to repentance. He calls us to recognize that we are by nature sinful and unclean. He calls us to acknowledge that we are lost and condemned creatures without him. That we are helpless beggars in need of mercy and grace. Jesus showed us love by taking up his cross and by patiently enduring the shame and rejection that came with it. He gave us a way to have our sin atoned for by shedding his holy blood. Jesus did not insist upon his own way, but he submitted to his Father's will. And Jesus does not continue to hold our sin against us by compiling a record of wrongs like some accountant. Instead, our substitute, our sacrifice, our Savior, erased the ledger for us. See, Jesus died for you. He died for you so that you would gain everything. So that you would become God's child. So that the most beautiful, melodious words you could ever hear would be spoken to you regularly. 
I forgive you all your sins. See, that is the significance of God's love. We will never be perfect at loving, but Jesus gives us love so that we can love others. More rules, selfishness, anger, jealousy, none of them ever produce love. Only love can create love. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Now, this does not mean that love is blind or foolish. No, it means that love never gives up hope. Love never ceases to believe. Never stops carrying other people's burdens. Love's job is never done. Love never ends. Or another translation, it says, love never fails. Love is without conditions. It is permanent and lasts forever. And sometimes in the body of Christ, members are really, really great at showing love. Sometimes it's just mind-blowing how you see another person loving another person. But other times, we're really, really bad at it, too. If we're not intentional, if we're not diligent, we will fail to show love. Why? Because it's not natural. We're sinners by nature, and it takes a constant reminding of Christ's love for us and a Holy Spirit-led effort to help us show love. Just like in a marriage, if the body of Christ is going to last love and forgiveness will be necessary. So why is it that Paul says that love never ends? Paul demonstrates that all other gifts are temporary and incomplete. And for that reason, they can't fulfill the role of love in the body. It's impossible. Only love can strengthen the body and bring it to full maturity in the end. Christ calls us to love the body just as much as he does. Jesus calls us to love one another as he loves us. He calls us to show love, to be active in love towards all. Jesus commands us to be merciful and gracious to each other, to be patient with one another, to look past our differences, and for us to sacrifice for the good of the whole body. Jesus Christ tells us to bear each burden as the body, to forgive each other's sins, and to speak love to each other regularly. Now here's a question you've probably never been asked. Does the person sitting next to you know that you love them? If they don't know that you love them, well, why not? If they do, then great. Great. When each of us knows without a doubt that we are loved by the rest of the members, then the body will be built up and thrive. And when we know that we love each other, then the body will be its most effective for the kingdom. Love is priceless and will continue to be proven throughout eternity. And finally, when Christ comes again, when he restores all of creation on the last day, then the limits of knowledge and prophesying, the limits of human speaking will all become obvious. Then we will know as we have been known, as Paul says. So remember, know this. God loves you, friends. His love for you endures forever. And Christ's love is shown through his body, through its members, through you. In a way, 1 Corinthians 13 is a call to live now as though we're living in eternity together right now. And when we show love to our neighbor, we're bringing a small piece of that future kingdom into the present. On the last day, what was done for yourself, it won't matter. But what is done for someone else is what will last. 
The body of Christ will not be complete or fully mature until Jesus returns. Until then, the body will struggle with growing pains and immaturity. And that's to be expected. To be expected. After all, the body of Christ is in so many ways still a helpless babe. And yet, remember, even an infant can have faith. Even a child can hope. Even a little one can love. So let me close by reading from 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loves us, we also ought to love one another. Amen. Today is Communion Sunday, and we have the privilege of fellowship with Jesus Christ and with one another in, uh, in Communion. All adults and confirmed youth who are trusting in Christ as their Savior, who are living in daily repentance of sin and believing what Jesus says in the word about his body and blood, that he is truly present with what we partake of. All then are invited to the Lord's table. Dearly beloved, as we purpose to come to the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we should carefully examine ourselves as St. Paul exhorts us. For this holy sacrament has been instituted for the special comfort and strengthening of those who humbly confess their sins and who hunger and thirst after righteousness. But if we do examine ourselves, we shall find nothing in us but sin and death, from which we cannot set ourselves free. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ has had mercy on us and has taken on himself our nature, that he might fulfill for us the whole will and law of God, and for our deliverance suffer death and all that we through our sins deserve. And to the end that we should confidently believe this and be strengthened by our faith, he has instituted the holy sacrament of his supper, in which he feeds us with his body and gives us to drink of his blood. Therefore, whoever, drink, therefore, whoever eats of this bread and drinks of this cup, firmly believing the words of Christ, dwells in Christ and Christ in him and has eternal life. We should also do this in remembrance of him, of his death and how he was delivered for our sins and raised for our justification. And with grateful hearts, we should take up our cross and follow him. And according to his commandment, love one another even as he has loved us. For we are all one bread and one body, even as we are partakers of this one bread and drink of this one cup. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, And when he had eaten and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. At this time, we'll invite our helpers up 
and the ushers will lead you forward. And remember that the cup afterwards goes in the baskets on either side. the body of Christ broken for you. crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, who now has bestowed upon you his holy body and blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all your sins, strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto everlasting life. 